Hi, it's David Tracy with the Autopia, and I'm here with Hubert Mees, legendary suspension designer. Today, we're going to be looking at a true icon, the first generation Ford Mustang. This platform was originally designed for the 1960 Falcon, spawned a whole bunch of different cars. And today, we're going to look in detail at how the suspension of this iconic car that sold in the hundreds of thousands works. All right, let's start at the back. All right, I see a solid axle. You see these in trucks these days. You do. This is a very simple, what's called a Hotchkiss suspension. It uses two leaf springs solidly bolted to the bottom of this axle. And the leaf springs are the suspension. They do everything. Normally in the suspension, you would have a bunch of links holding the axle in place and coil springs holding the body up. But in this case, you have these two leaf springs and they do everything. So like with the F-150 Raptor, it has solid axle, but a ton of links, right? That's right. So all those links are trying to control the motion of the axle. And then all the coil springs in that design are doing is holding up the weight of the vehicle. So you've got two coil springs and you've got upper links. So that's two lower links. That's four. And then one lateral link. You might have a lateral link. Five links and two springs. Whereas this you that's have. Right. You have two springs and that's it. Wow. Very okay. simple, very, very effective. Um, these springs are, they, they locate the axle side to side. They locate the axle fore and aft. And of course, being springs, they control the motion up and down as well. Okay, they do it all. I, I will note that the shocks on this, they're both on the same side of the axle. And when I'm trailing a truck in traffic today, I always see one in front and one behind. That's right. Modern day solid axles will have one shock on the front of the axle and say this shock would be mounted behind the axle. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is when you apply torque to, uh, to a solid axle like this, to try to get the car to roll forward, the wheels are trying to roll forward, but the axle is trying to roll in the opposite direction. And the only thing resisting that is the springs. So the springs then bend into an S shape because the axle is trying to twist them. And then what happens is if you lose traction, the axle snaps back to straight, then the wheel regains traction, the axle come, winds back up, and this cycle starts happening very quickly. So these Mustangs must have... These Mustangs are awful for that. Uh. It's called axle tramp or axle hop. They're awful for that. Hmm. And there were some fixes back in the day that people applied. They are called uh, traction bars, which bolted to the bottom of the, of the axle here and the spring and would push up against the spring here. You may have seen them in hot rods of the All old the days. All the time, yeah. You see them. That's what they are. And they're trying to, to control that axle wind up that you get with a leaf spring. So you basically accelerate, this thing tries to twist, but then the rod just slams up against it. That's right, that's right. But this, is a, this design was from the late 1950s. Engines weren't so powerful back then. Uh, axle hop wasn't as big of a, a problem, but in the 60s when you got much more powerful motors, this became a real problem. So this car was originally so, sort of a secretary's car. Exactly. Maybe they didn't realize what it would become from, from they, a sports they had, they had no idea. Yeah. And they didn't understand that whole axle hop phenomenon yet. So here you have the shocks both on the, uh, on the same side of the axle. Putting one shock on the back of the axle forces the shocks to move when the axle wants to twist and shocks resist that. Mm -hmm. So you had something pushing back on the suspension and it would dampen out that uh, hop. Okay, I noticed multiple leaves on this. We looked at a truck, uh, not the other episode, we looked at the F-150 base truck, mm -hmm. single leaf with the helper at the bottom. Yeah, it, more modern design, more modern materials. The materials to do a single leaf didn't exist back in the day when this was built. Nowadays, we have much better materials. We also have composites that you make springs out of. But here you see a, a stack of, of leaves. The other thing that would, this allowed you to do is you could vary the stack and get different spring rates much more easily that way. Let's look at the front because if you've worked on modern suspensions, then you'd look at this and there'd be a lot of weird stuff happening. Like it's not obvious how it, how it all works. Right. This actually, in concept is very similar to a modern double wishbone suspension. You actually have what's functioning as a lower wishbone here, but it's, it's made out of two pieces. You have this lateral link right here, and you have this bar that is solidly bolted to it that goes to these bushings in the front. But this, the, the bending in this bar notwithstanding, this actually all acts as a rigid structure. And you, you basically have an A-arm. Yeah, it looks you like You have a, a lower wishbone here mm -hmm. made out of these two pieces that just are bolted together. Ah, okay. And then on the top, you have a more traditional type of stamped 
lower arm mm -hmm. here at the top. And so yeah. the two of them here together form a double, double wishbone. wishbone. Yeah, I, I guess it's not obvious to the two it's pieces, obvious. but I, it's it actually is. Now that, you, now, now that you show it, it is right. kind of obvious. Right. But what's interesting about this particular design and something you didn't see in any other designs in that era, and you certainly don't see any of that today, is that the spring in this case is attached to the upper arm. Oh, wow. I, you know, I, I always assumed these were torsion. Like a lot of cars during that era were torsion. They bars, were right? torsion. Our Chrysler had a lot of torsion suspensions, mm -hmm. torsion beam suspensions. This is a coral spring, but the coral spring is sitting on the upper arm. Now, I heard a story many years ago that I hope it's true because I think it's a great story. The story that I heard was the reason that the spring is on the upper arm is that this suspension was originally designed to be for a front wheel drive car. And having the spring up on the upper arm left the space in between the arms open for a drive shaft to go through. Obviously, if you look at this design, you couldn't do that. So it, it, if that story is right. true, the suspension certainly evolved before it actually made it into production in a way that precluded a front wheel drive system from ever working. Right, because there's no place to put the ha half shaft, yeah, that's the, right. the frame, no space the anymore. rail itself. Doesn't have to be. Right. But it is a fun story, like if that's how it originated and it just sort of morphed. Exactly. There was a version of these cars that was put out by Carroll Shelby and the GT 350s and GT 500s, th that series of cars. And he made a change to the suspension to improve the handling of the cars. And it's a change that anyone who owns a Mustang could actually do themselves. Huh. What they did was they took the two holes that the upper arm attaches to and they drilled another set of them one inch lower. And they, instead of mounting the upper arm to the holes that were there from the factory, they mounted them to those two holes that are one inch lower. And what that did is it changed the angle of the upper control arm and it changed it slightly like this and that increased the amount of camber gain that you get in, in, in suspension motion, which is good for, for the handling, good for steering, good for response, and it made the cars much more fun to drive. There it is, the uh, iconic first-gen Ford Mustangs suspension, brought to you by the suspension genius, Hubert Meese. <laughs>